Holly McKay, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. My gosh, you're one of those writers that when you write, you feel what you write. There's, there's very little people that translate across paper journalistically and have integrity the way that you do. And so I'm so glad to have you on the show as a, a fan of your writing, but as a, somebody who's grateful that there are not only people out there doing what you do and taking the chances and risks that you do, but a woman doing it. So thanks for that. I appreciate you from like a humanity standpoint. Thank you. Thank you for your support. It means a lot. Yeah, no worries. So I want to, I really want to kind of dive in here because there's so much to talk with you about. You're so well-versed and educated on um, the Middle East and kind of what goes on there. So I'm, I'm kind of curious a little bit about you though, before we get into it, what really brought you to journalism? Because you're Australian and then not only journalism, but the terrorism and like the nitty gritty and the, the, the dirty journal, like journalism that needs to be done. What made you get, go there? So I guess I never really had a desire to be a journalist. I loved to write growing up. That was something I always loved to do. And I was actually a ballet dancer. And I grew up in a small country town and I went to a boarding school when I was young so that I could sort of pursue the dance and the arts a little bit more along with my studies. And so, you know, in a strange way, that was actually really an amazing training ground for what I do because it sort of taught me from a very young age, obviously, to be very independent and um, financially independent and just, you know, living, living on my own, really. And so I, from there, I, you know, but, but I learned about, you know, all, we studied music and, and dance and just all these cultures and all these parts of the world that I would never have known otherwise, you know, growing up in, in a small town in that way. And, and my parents, you know, my father worked in the coal mines. My mother is a, a primary school teacher. So, um, you know, we didn't really travel or, or do anything, you know, super extravagant when I was young. But this really just opened up my eyes to this, this world. And I think it also gave me a, a very strong work ethic and, and sense of discipline from a young age. Um, and it was something I loved really deeply. And then when I was about 18, I just turned 18, I broke my ankle. And so I sort of had to go back to school and, and I didn't even then really know what I wanted to do. Again, I love to write, but I never saw that as being a career. Um, I always just thought that was something you, you did on the side. Um, so I was sort of studying human rights law and a few things and then got a bit restless and went to New York to finish my degree. So I was 20 and that was in 2006. And yeah, so I, I, when I got there, I, I heard about these internships and I thought it's not something we had in Australia. I was working full time and going to night school. So this internship, this unpaid internship, I was a little bit intrigued and I kind of wanted to be in on it. So I just applied to a bunch of these news organizations and it happened to be that Fox had called me back. And um, I think because I had a background a little bit, not only in writing, but in a bit of web coding as well. Mind you, I've forgotten all of it. But back then, you know, it was, it was the, the digital age was kind of just starting. And so right. news wasn't, you didn't have news on all these websites. I mean, the websites were just a very small subsidiary thing mm -hmm. to news channels in, in 2006. And there wasn't social media and things. So because of that background, they put me in the digital side of it, which was really a blessing in disguise, I think, because the other interns, they all wanted to be on air. And so they kind of, ended up doing these very much, you know, getting coffee jobs for these broadcast shows. Whereas I was the only, um, I guess the only person who just really wanted to write and, and be a little bit more behind the scenes. And I didn't have a desire to be on television. So I really was able to, to do full work and, and I didn't have to get coffee and I didn't have to do all those sort of intern things. And so I was able to work really hard. And at the end of that, they offered me, um, not only a job, but but I was sponsored. So that was sort of a, a really an incredible opportunity at that age. And as much as I wanted to, part of me wanted to go back to that dancing career. I also understood that, you know, it was such a unique chance to to live in America and to work for this big news organization and and have my own column at that point. So I went to LA and I lived there for, for quite a while, but I was doing general assignments and then I guess really in my mid-20s, that's when I 
I started focusing a lot more on the war reporting. I think, you know, living in LA, you are surrounded by um, you know, a lot of wonderful creative people, but a lot of superficiality. And I, just <laughs> I love always, how you worded that. Yeah, I just, it was like this place. I just, it was like a zoo, you know, where you're on the outside looking in and it wasn't like I ever fit into that, that sort of mold. And I, I didn't really know where my place was. So for me, that was really just a stepping stone to, to kind of do more. And I, I had that again from those ballet days, that deep curiosity about the world and started to travel a lot and, um, and really just, yeah, wanted to pursue this particular niche. I wanted to, to kind of go to these places that, that people you know, didn't really want to go to and try to understand that and bring that story back. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the journalist to, you know, that general assignment, which I think is great, but I, that's just not what <laughs> I wanted to do. I really wanted to have, have this niche. And I, I really just fell in love with, um, with that sort of international reporting. So you're telling me that repeating the COVID deaths 24 seven on repeat, isn't like fun to you. You don't enjoy <laughs> you know, reciting. I had, do, I had to do some of that in the beginning of the pandemic when basically everybody had to do that because that right. was the only story that existed. And then, yeah, after about a week, I was like, is there something else we can do? <laughs> There's, <this laughs> There's gotta be. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating to me that you started off with uh, a discipline like dance, uh, which generally seems more of a, hmm, art, the arts, what that I think um, a dancer would go into is not necessarily war reporting. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to say that super. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. No, I think think it's fascinating. if If you told me, as a you know, as a teenager, as a fifteen year old, that that this would be my career, I I would have thought that was just sort of crazy. But um, yeah, I guess I like to surprise. <laughs> but it, yeah, no, I think it's interesting though because there's a lot of correlations to me as well. You know, when you look at the independence and reliability, like relying on yourself, that person that you're relying on in a war zone is often yourself and the wits about you. And as a dancer, as an individual athlete, as that, I see that as a I could maybe see you looking at you as a dancer and going, yeah, she could be a report. She could do a job like that. She could be a cop. She could be a soldier because that's an individual thing. That's a strength within type of individual Mm -hmm. to become successful at that. So I could make a correlation and a complete like, holy hell, I would never have guessed that. Um, It's just interesting though, to, to know your background a little bit, because, because watching you go through, I mean, you're only a couple, I think you're two years older than me, two or three years older than me, but watching you go through it the way the war this past 20 years and how you've written about it and your experiences with it. And then I've had so little, but I've had a military experience and being a woman and often you're not exactly um, somebody I would be like, she's heinous looking. (laughs) So, I mean, (laughs) let's be real here. Like, let's call it what it is. You're going into these war zones where you're you're beautiful. You stand out. You're, you're not often from the places you're reporting on. And that puts, a a poses a different type of target. Um, and that's a reality. I think people kind of forget. And I think it's important to acknowledge because you're in places and you're having conversations with, with some individuals who don't deem you even worthy to be in the building with them. them. And so I'm curious to really, I want to pick you apart. There's so many things um, that most importantly, when 9-11 happened, where were you and what was that to you? And did that Mm. have an impact? Yeah, I just, I wrote about this recently. So yeah, I was, um, I was in Australia. I think I was at boarding school and so I was, yeah, I was 15, a couple of weeks shy of 16, I guess. And yeah, I just, it did, it did have a huge impact because I think at that point in time, you know, we lived in a bubble. Um, I didn't really, you know, pay much attention to, to you know, the world or news or, or really didn't have much idea about where these places were or these terrorist groups. But I, I, I just remember that, you know, even though I was sort of a world away from the United States, it was a, it was a very confronting feeling. And I think it, it sort of forced me to, 
want to understand things a little bit better. And I think, you know, even though I was young, I felt that I, I should have had a, a deeper understanding of these places and, and what was happening and, and sort of the reasons why. And I think that was certainly a factor in, in wanting, in, in me wanting to, to write about some of these issues and effectively be um, a communicator or a vessel that could sort of decipher a lot of these things because I think, and, and still now there is just so much confusion about a country like Afghanistan. And I, I repeatedly have to remind people that Afghans themselves were not directly involved in 9-11, despite that being the country we invaded. Um, so I think there's just sort of a lot of, of misunderstandings. And I think if you can, you can bridge that and you can reach people and, and certainly what I do, I'm not trying to write these highbrow policy papers. I'm not trying to, to appeal to the think tanks in Washington. I'm, I'm really trying to help it be that sort of vehicle for, for just the regular person to be able to understand what is happening on the ground in, in some of these faraway places. And so I think 9-11 really um, was, a, was definitely a catalyst for that. It's interesting to watch um, the generation that we are speaking about it afterward, because I don't know that any of us really could have understood the weight that that would have had on our upcoming life I was young at the time as well. So it's a very, it's strange now to kind of put the points backwards when you look. Um, were you always a communicator when you were young? Did you? I think so. Yeah. I think, I mean, dance was, and I was just telling someone about this today, but, but when people always ask me, but you don't have this, you know, really kind of Oka Australian accent, like I guarantee if you heard my parents talk, you would probably be like, Ugh. Gosh, where are they from? Um, and that was really because my mother, Your when I was face. very young, I know my mother, when I was a young age, she put my sister and I into these elocution lessons. And so I think, you know, we grew up in this small town and she just had this, you know, she wanted her daughters to be proper in some kind of way. <laughs> Might've worked out for my sister a little bit more than me, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, but I, at the time I hated it, but I really recognize now you know, having that grounding, learning good manners, a lot of these old fashioned things that we would look at today and just think they were absolutely absurd. But I, I, I got so much out of them, you know, and they've really helped me to you know, navigate different cultures and, and certainly uncertain situations. So I think, um, yeah, I think that sort of was another big shaper in, in kind of how I how I'm able to adapt to different cultures and customs. Did, um, did you have military family growing up? Uh, not directly, but my grandfather, um, or my, my father's father, who I never met, um, but he was in World War II. And I think, again, that was, you know, that's something I never met him and my dad never really knew him. So he came back from the war and my Nana was very young. She was about probably 15 or six, you know, yeah, I think she was 15 when she met him. And he was just extremely, um, you know, he'd been in, in Papua New Guinea. So that was sort of just a really heinous place and, and been there a really long time and, and gone in very young and came back. And, and I think, you know, my Nana basically married him because she felt sorry for him because he was just so, and so, you know, such a, he had a lot of substance abuse problems and he ended mm -hmm. up actually dying from, I believe it was uh, like alcohol was like drinking like methylated Aww. spirits. So it was, you know, really tragic, but that I think that had such an impact on, on my father growing up in, in um, you know, and I think that, you know, automatically you, you, you look at that and, and, and the impacts of that um, and the cost of that. And I, I definitely saw how not having a father had impacted my father. And so, I think, um, you know, that's something I'm also very aware of when I'm covering war is being able to really look at the cost of war and um, the ramifications of war and, and what people go through and, and how they struggle oftentimes to come back. And I think that um, the aftermath of, of war, we tend to forget sometimes, you know, when wars are over, the news moves on. But I think the aftermath of war is, is just as important to cover because that's really often the most difficult time because that's when there's no longer the aid organizations. That's when there's no longer the television crews. That's when people are suffering the worst and there is no 
really means to support them. So that's also a really big part of, of why I do this job. It's, it's interesting to see things kind of come full circle for you and to see you kind of be that catalyst point in the family afterwards, right? When, when the intergenerational trauma stops, the positive mm -hmm. can often move forward and that you're kind of a byproduct of that, which is fantastic in talking about healing from things. I mean, you, you have your book only cry for the living. And I've been listening to, I was telling you before I was, I've been listening to the audiobook. I'm almost all the way through it. Um, it was forwarded by Jocko and he's got a, a, that kind of voice that grabs you right from the get, which was a, which was a fantastic start to it. Um, but then hearing you read it, which was really well done, by the way, I love when authors read their own books. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. I can hear you saying it. I can hear you like your wheels turning into me that, that grabs you. But I think if you have been to Afghanistan or the Middle East or any war for that matter, there's so many things that you write about that are so heavy, but you write them in such an eloquent way as, as horrific as some of the things you've seen and witnessed it's amazing to see how much you smile. Um, and I think that's because you you do a lot of work in this space. Um, I see you you do uh, a lot of burn victims. You work with uh, mm -hmm. a lot of organizations like that. And you're talking about the cost of war. You're talking about afterwards when, when individuals are left to kind of deal with whatever the hell that 20 years was. Um, mm -hmm. They're left in the aftermath how is it that you hang on to your hope and humanity and that the thing that makes you smile so much? Mm -hmm. It definitely is a struggle. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's certainly something that I struggle with. Um, but I also recognize that I have to live in the real world and, and do, you know, very ordinary mundane things when I'm back here and, and, you know, nobody wants to be around you know, somebody who all they can talk about is is the darkness and the war. And even though there certainly is sometimes that that's all I want to talk about or or not talk at all. Um, I guess for me, it's just I have to give myself time to adjust, um, especially when I'm coming back from long assignments. But I think you you know to a degree you you have to do those ordinary things. You have to have friends that that don't have anything to do with wars or conflict or heavy things and you have to spend time with them and you have to go to the movies and you have to um, you know just enjoy very basic things in life I think because you do lose yourself and when I am working in a lot of these places there is that you do lose yourself and, and when I come out of it I, I have to make a very conscious effort to to find my footing again um, and it's certainly sometimes it's harder than other times but I can't be living in a, in a war and, you know, I can't be living in a war in my head 24 seven, you know, 12 months out of the year. So I think that, um, yeah, it, it does require a really a conscious effort to, to sort of stay on top of your mental health as best as you can. Are there other things that you do? Because honestly, there's people who have been on, like me, have been on one deployment and it wiped out any sort of mental fortitude that was there and it took mm -hmm. a decade to get it back. You're in and out, you're in and out, you're in and out, you're in and out. And you're not, you're not seeking out firefights, but you're seeing worse than mm -hmm. often firefights. You're seeing the other end of what's on those firefights. Um, yeah, I think for me, I just, I'm very grateful for the fact that from a young age, I really found what it is that I believe is, is my pa passion and purpose in life. And I think so many people go through life never finding that or never really realizing what that is and always searching for it. So as much as I feel very lost in other aspects of my life, I feel very grateful to have found this path of something that I just, I firmly believe in. And I firmly believe that is what I meant to be doing. And I think that drives me to recognize that I want to be doing this for a long time. I want that sort of longevity in my career. And so I have to really 
you know, what to stay on top of that. I have to even talk to a therapist. I have to talk to my friends about it when I need to. I have to, um, you know, put things in, you know, and, and have that ordinary life and, and be able to go to the beach and go surfing or go shooting or ride my motorcycle, whatever it is, I have to, I have to find time for those things. And I think probably the biggest thing that I struggle with is maybe isolationism a little bit. I struggle to be around too many people at once. Um, I don't particularly love, you know, going out to, to big affairs, but I enjoy spending, you know, time, you know, in small groups with people, or, mm -hmm. you know, I find it a little bit overwhelming um, these days to, to kind of be in, in very sort of hectic environments. So I just have to, and I have to be okay with saying no to those things. I think we put so much pressure on ourselves in life that we have to say yes to this and go here and go there. And I think once we can sort of forgive ourselves a little bit and just simply learn to say no, there's something, there's so much freedom in that. And so, um, I try to you know, obviously not be selfish, but try to put myself, put my, you know, the, my desires and my health and, and recognize when I need to take a break and with, and recognize when that break goes on for too long. And I need to, you know, I need to get back out into the world. So I think um, self-awareness. And I think that's something, even from a young age, I think that sense of self-awareness, um, that's something that's always been very instilled in me. And that probably, again, comes from my ballet background. Um, you know, my mother was, you know, kind of flower child slash drama sort of teacher. So everything about me was, you know, when you're a child and you're crying, you know, why are you crying? What's upsetting you? Why is it making you feel that? And I would have to answer this sort of litany of questions. And I think, you know, that's actually helped me to become, you know, very self-aware in my adult life about where I feel things are missing and where I, I can, um, you know, change my own life. You were emotionally intelligent from the beginning. You were given the tools in the toolbox, were you? You were one uh. of those kids. I think, well, I'd like to think so. I'm certainly a work in progress, but that's but yeah. awesome. I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that your parents were self-aware enough. I mean, my gosh, if we only had more of those. Can you imagine how much better the world would be? I'm not going to yeah, go there. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. So tell me a little bit about this. So I want to know about the book because it spans over quite a bit of time. Did you start? go in to the Middle East thinking, okay, this, you know, I'm going to report on everything and eventually write something on this. Or did you just kind of cumulate stories together? How did this lay out? Because I'm, I'm not all the way through it yet. I'm three quarters. Yeah. And so don't ruin the ending for me, but, um, but I think I kind of know where the ending's going. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so tell me, tell me about it, please. So I am so, I guess ISIS took over well, Mosul and a bunch of Iraq 2014. And so I went in really quite early before the US had sort of started any kind of engagement there. And I went in really just thinking I would do a little bit of reporting. I didn't have a book in mind. Um, and when I went, I just, I felt very compelled to continue to tell that story. So I went in so many more times after that, over a span of really four and a half years. Um, but what you know, I think it was around 2016, so around the midpoint, I remember just looking in my little Santa Monica apartment in LA, and I just had all these books, um, just these notebooks, and I'm, I guess, a little bit of an old school journalist in that I, I tend to shorthand everything as opposed to, you know, trying to record a thousand things. I record a lot more now, but but back then, everything was shorthand, um, so I just had so much, and, and I would always write down details, so when we'd be driving, I'd write down, you know, I saw who I saw what they looked like what I'm you know just those little details and so I had so many notebooks and I looked at them one day and just thought I knew I wanted to write a book I just I had no idea what that looked like um and what that would be and I just thought you know this is I, I want to do it in excerpts I want to do it as, as what I call memos um I think that is a way of telling these individual stories where people can get a sense of the big picture, but you do it through individual stories as opposed to trying to throw a whole bunch of statistics at people mm -hmm. or trying to, to tell something that is incredibly complicated. And most people will switch off. And I didn't want that to happen. I wanted people to understand it. So I think by telling 
much smaller stories and really through these memos. So it doesn't feel like you're having to sort of sit through this very long chronological book, but you can you can go through it and learn about all these individual stories. And I think that that really is something I, I would hope that sort of become a little bit more of a, my signature style and, and the books that I want to do in the future. I kind of want to be able to write in that similar vein. I think that's just, I want people to stay and read and I want it to be accessible to, to someone who has really doesn't have a, you know, a hugely strong background in understanding the Middle East. Well, it's interesting because it does, because of the way you lay it out, it does, in my opinion, give that the whole picture ideal and it breaks it down. It's super digestible. Um, especially I, I mean, the, the knowledge of weaponry and, and all of the acronyms that you give it kind of, I, I smirk every time I kind of read one. Cause I just love, I love hearing the in-depth descriptive parts of the book because it really sets its setting. It sets it for you. You can feel it. The only thing that you're not getting is the heat. That is literally the only thing you don't get from it, which is great. Um, I'm curious to see, I'm curious to see how this all plays out because I, I feel like everybody needs to read it just for the fact that you, you've done such a good job of describing what has kind of gone on in, in the past since ISIS came in, how they came in, what it's like to live under ISIS rule and really what the truth is behind everything. I think there was, um, a particular part of the book that really just kind of, you know, you have one of those moments and then you, you leave something and you're, you a couple days later and you're like, Oh, there's that thought. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, there's the one in particular, um, about the gas attack, the, the sarin and, and the child mm. that survived. Um, there was this, this overwhelming feeling of that, when you see something from the Holocaust and you talk to a Holocaust survivor, and if you're ever like, I had the, I had the opportunity and honor to sit in front of a Holocaust survivor. And when I was in high school, when I lived in Ontario, we went to the Holocaust museum and she would, she told her story. And then right after you spoke with her, you went through the rest of the museum. And there was something about the way that you told that story and how he worked at a monument that is meant to to really honor his family, but his family was in there. And there was this, because I had had that little experience, I felt a weird connection to that. And my heart just broke for this, mm -hmm. for this boy. And, um, I just, I don't, I, I don't know. I have to take breaks in between your book because it, it hits really, really hard emotionally. And I think that's exactly what you're going for, because I think that's what will change the world is people. Yeah. I, I think, you don't, you know, we, we tend to sanitize a lot of stuff here, especially in the West and news. And actually something else that I, I mentioned in the book a little bit is I remember at first when you're watching television in the Middle East and how confronting it is because you're seeing, you know, basically they'll show everything. They show dead bodies. They show somebody being shot. They show, they show everything in, in the Middle East news. And I remember at first being a little bit jarred by it and, and I was at a friend's house and, and there was little kids running around and watching it. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, how can these, these children be watching this? And I thought, but this is their reality. And they're, they're taught that reality from a very young age. Um, and it's not sanitized because this is, is what's going on. So they grow up understanding what is going on around them. And it's very different to, I guess, the reality most of us uh, face when we in the West, when you know you have to blur out uh, disturbing images, you have to, you know, that there's just so many protocols of, of sanitizing. And I, I don't know that that always does us a, you know, a great service. So I think with this book, being able to write it in a raw way, you know, didn't, it doesn't require any clickbait. It doesn't require any sensationalism. It just, it is what it is. And I think that's important for, for anyone wanting to understand these issues to to understand that brutality of war that it's there's there's nothing nice about it the the times that you go into the hospitals and you're with and you're with the women and they're trying to give you their children how do you walk away from that what do you do in those incidents when somebody does yeah, that it is i mean it's just it's it's hard and and 
you know, I just, I spent the past five months in Afghanistan and it was even worse there because people would look at me and go, well, she's an American and Australian and she can leave. And so can she take my child sort of thing? Because people, so many people are trying to leave. And I, you know, obviously just, I, I have to sort of look at them and, 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 you know, I guess honor, honor them in the way of, of, you know, thanking them for, um, you know, wanting to entrust their child with me and, and what an honor that is. But at the same time, you know, I'm obviously not, I can't take your child, even if I'd wanted to, um, you know, so it is hard. You just have to, you have to, to try to give them whatever dignity that you can and to, um, to listen to their story. And something that I, it was a really big struggle, especially with Afghanistan, is everybody is sort of coming at you, wanting you to, to, to get them out of the country and, and, you know, people that don't even know you, you know, they, they hear that a foreigner is in the building and suddenly they're at you with their documents. And I, and I just have to politely say, that's just not what I do. And, and the amount of requests that come at me, I, I certainly couldn't do it if I tried. Um, and I just have to remember that, you know, that's not my job. My job is to, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. I'm happy to give you a website address to go to, but beyond that, my job is to tell your story or tell the story of the Iraqi or the Afghan or whoever it may be people. That's what I, that's what I there to do. And I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves sometimes to try to do more. And I, and I often need to take a step back and remind myself that I'm not here to change policy. I can't get people out of the country, but I can tell a story. And I think that I just have to keep reminding myself of that, even in, these really difficult times and, and people get very angry at you when you you sort of say that you can't you can't get them out and so it is um yeah it's 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 a challenge when you started going into Iraq and Afghanistan how did you even begin to move around that country safely so basically you have to you have to hire what we we call a fixer so Usually when journalists are working in, in any sort of foreign place, especially conflict places, you hire a local, which is sort of, I guess they act a little bit like a producer, but they, um, they're they usually local. Sometimes they're a journalist themselves, sometimes not. They just have to have, you know, good connections. Usually they're also an interpreter, so they, they work to translate for you. Um, and so really a lot of the, the quality of your work really rests on the quality of your fixer. Uh, so before I go, I usually try to, to tee up my fixer. Um, and yeah, and then just sort of discuss what, what storylines I want to cover or where it is that I want to go. And then I, yeah, basically get there and, um, and meet with them. And, and then, yeah, depending on how long I'm going to be there, sort of, yeah, begin, begin the work. And, and I really, we really do entrust a lot to our fixers and they also risk a lot in, in, in helping us, and especially in hostile environments where they can be left um, with retaliation. So I'm um, like, yeah, a lot of it does rest on, on your fixer and you have to trust a fixer. I've always been very fortunate in my experiences to have really great fixes, but certainly there's been horror stories in, in places like Syria where other journalists have been sold out by their fixes, where their fixes will you know, sell them for an X amount of money to a jihadi group. And, and we've seen that a lot. So it's, it's, um, it's a it's a challenging risk and it's it's uh something we usually do word of mouth a lot more i think these days because that's really the only way to vet sometimes is to to go via word of mouth with this particular trip with afghanistan and um, the fixer that i had before the fall you know the, he left the country so we were sort of back to square one when the taliban were in power and and all the fixes that we we sort of known for the for the past 10, 20 years had all had all left the country. So we were back to square one and there really wasn't um really wasn't anyone that we could trust. So in the end, I I got a few LinkedIn messages from from Afghans who saw some of my work and were said, you know, I'm I am offering to help if you if you're looking for a fixer while you're here. Um so that was probably the first time in my life that I just had to take someone that I met from LinkedIn um oh. yeah and so we we had you know a guy named Naweed who who turned out to be wonderful and is a dear friend but he you know I remember he came to the to the house and you know we kind of went through a series of questions you know do you speak Pashto do you speak um 
a diary, do you, you know, all these things. And, and yes, yes, yes. And I said, okay, well, we'll give you a go where, you know, and, uh, <laughs> give you a go. Um, yeah. And imagine, you know, I'm traveling all over the country with, with Noeed and, and his cousin, who's our driver. I mean, Kandahar, I mean, Norristown, I mean, Kuna and, and all these places with, with him, uh, you know, someone I didn't really know, but, but again, it's, Sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith. And, and certainly that's what I had to do this time. There really wasn't, wasn't much of an option because the, yeah, the fixes at all basically left. And, yeah. you know, the other interesting part was a couple of the fixes that were there that we ha- also had known for several decades turned out to be Taliban's the whole time. So they, you know, suddenly okay. were out, were like, yeah, yeah, I've been a commander for 20 years. And we're just like, oh my goodness, you know, you used to be at all the parties drinking alcohol and, now you're telling me that you've been Taliban the whole time, but yeah, so it's a different world. Oh my God, that's wild because I just, I've been in that country and like the idea of st- stepping foot outside of the unit or somewhere where there wasn't a bunch of other individuals and you're just like, yeah, I'll meet you on LinkedIn. What's up? Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> kind of, I know a lot of my military friends think I'm crazy and, and general. I think that's why. I echo their sentiments yeah. to you. Look at you. Journalism. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I think that's also what I love about journalism too, is this, this very Wild West freedom to it in that because you aren't working for the government, you're not subject to anyone else's rules. I can talk to whoever I want, do whatever I want. Um, and certainly that makes a lot of my military friends absolutely crazy because they're just, what are you doing? How can you be so reckless? And it's just kind of how... I guess it's part and parcel with doing the job. I think, you know, if you were trying to, you know, to sort of stick to a bunch of rules, I just think, I don't think you would ever get to the story. Um, Because, you know, we don't have the resources that the military has in terms of aircraft and transport. So we kind of just have to take those risks. Um, I remember one time, you know, being in Baghdad, actually, actually being in Camp Taji outside of Baghdad, and I was doing, I stayed a couple of days there with an Australian um, military unit. And I was supposed to fly to, I think it was the Al-Assad Air Base near the Syrian border. And they just kept continue, continued to be these dust storms and the flight just kept getting delayed, delayed. And I was just getting really annoyed. And I had another interview lined up that I wanted to go and do. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to get to um, to Anbar, then I'm going to go back to Baghdad and, and go to Sada City. Or I think I was trying to interview Muqtada al-Sada. So I remember being in Taji and just literally getting on my phone to call a cab to come out to pick me up and drive me back oh. to a hotel in Baghdad. And I remember these Australian soldiers were with me, like, are you just going to get a car to Baghdad? I said, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm going to do. And I remember they just looked at me like, one of them said, he goes, you're crazy. And then in the next breath, he says, I'm jealous. <laughs> I was like, yep, yeah, that's what mm-hmm. I'm going to do. <laughs> so I'm going to get so. a cab and I'm a piece out on the sketchy freeway. Like there's no bombs yeah. on it at all. Yeah. I so see like was... clips of you just in cars on freeways. And my heart just goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't like it. It doesn't feel right. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then you're in these vehicles with like a ton of human beings. I'm like, oh, this is this is a bad scene from a movie. I don't want to watch it. <laughs> but then I also see these insanely incredible, beautiful photos from places in Afghanistan that yeah. people like me would never have gotten to see if you were yeah. just like, I'm going to wear cowboy boots under my burqa and peace out. I was the biggest brat. I swear. So the Taliban's moved next door, even in a house in Kabul. And just to piss them off, I'd play Biggie and Tupac really loud because they ban music. And so, you know, so it's like the Taliban's are my neighbors and they'd be hanging outside. It just, it, the funny thing is, and this is what is crazy, especially, you know, for having someone like, like yourself who served over there during the Taliban when it was an insurgency, it was like this switch overnight. So suddenly, you know, the Taliban's are just, they're everywhere. Like we, we would joke, you know, first couple of weeks into it, we're just like, we're sick of the Taliban. Like, can they just go away now? You know, they're annoying. <laughs> um, and how crazy that was really, because these were people that I, you know, a in the mountains and suddenly they're a government who 
and, and for them, this is the first time that they can walk freely down the street and, and go to, you know, let's see them all in Kabul Zoo, looking at the animals. And it just, it was this very, you know, they'd be sitting next to you in the cafe, or as I said, they were my neighbors. So they just were everywhere. And it was just this sort of bizarre um, overnight transition that happened. And uh, yeah, just to think that, you know, that, that we were sort of, that I would ever be interacting on a daily basis to the Taliban with the Taliban's like that, when they would suddenly be jumping in my car or telling me to come to their house for dinner or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, still so bizarre when I look and think back on it and, and how, I guess, terrified we were of this, this, this concept of the Taliban's. We were, my God, weren't we ever? Yeah. Oh. Like, and, and and rightfully so. They were right. you know, doing some pretty nasty stuff during that, that insurgency. Yeah, they decided to hit hard right around my time. They couldn't have just chilled out a little. No, no. 2009, we're like, let's just make a mess. Oh, yeah, that's the surge time. That was the mm. it was a good summer. Making. Mm-hmm. It was a solid time. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating, like I said, because to know that you've been in the same areas, it's just so your interaction has been so different. I, I want to know a little bit about the past year, mm-hmm. about what that's been like for you in the past year, considering all the intensity in Afghanistan, the pullout, what that looked like, but being on the ground for those situations. Do you mind walking me through a little yeah. bit? Yeah. So, I mean, I ended up, so my photographer, Jake and I, we're, we ended up in um, Mazar, in a city in the north, when it fell. And certainly that was not our plan, you know, I, again, I just, we went there, the plan was to go for a few days, you know, we certainly did not expect things to escalate the way that they did. No um, one did. Nobody did. And, you know, I asked everybody and everyone said, you know, at least it's, it's going to hold at least for a couple of weeks. And and I was going up there, I'd spent a couple of years ago, I, I, I spent a little bit of time in Ankara with uh, General Dostum, who was a warlord in that area. And, and um so, you know, he invited me to go back there again and he was leading some resistance forces. And, and given, you know, that he is this very mythological creature, um, he was the last person I would have thought would have ever left the fight, you know, and essentially handed it over to the Taliban. Um, so I felt comfortable enough going there and it was going to be with the commandos and, you know, do, do some work there. And that, I think we arrived, that was a really early on a Thursday morning. And, you know, the, the the city was just full of life. And it was hard for me to wrap my head around this idea that that even the provinces around had fallen because you would never have guessed that anything was, was different because people, you know, Afghans are very resilient. They're getting on with life. There's a lot of vibrancy. The markets are full, cabs everywhere. The things that I thought were very strange, though, were there was no police presence at all in the city, no military, no police presence. And I thought... How bizarre that was, given that the city was, you know, supposedly on the brink of falling, or at least it was surrounded mm-hmm. by Taliban that, that had taken over sort of a bunch of those northern provinces. And I remember thinking that was strange. I also remember thinking it was strange that there was no air power when we knew that there was fighting happening outside the city. And we'd spent all this money on an Afghan air force. And I thought, well, where is this air force? You know, why am I not hearing anything? What is what is kind of going on? So that sort of points to really the ineptitude um, at that point of, you know, the government's government forces or government really being able to uh, mobilize their forces in any way. So by Friday, which is the Afghan day off, obviously a little bit quieter in general, but I remember thinking it was a little bizarre and I spent, you know, time interviewing people and there were a lot of people that had fled um, from different parts and, and everybody was was trying to get to Kabul because everybody was convinced that Kabul was never going to fall. Um, but I think even then I just I didn't I didn't I certainly didn't think it was going to fall the following day. Um, so we woke up Saturday and it's it's so funny because I think of this and I remember waking up Saturday morning and I was just I was this mess and I was crying and I was like what is going on with me because this just wasn't it just wasn't my normal kind of behavior. Mm-hmm. And it's just sort of funny, again, it's that intuitive idea of, of the body knowing something you don't know. And so, yeah, here my just, I was just this absolute mess. And 
in a way, I think that was sort of bracing me for something big to kind of happen, even though I, so, you know, in my consciousness was not aware of that. Um, so that that day we we went out to the markets and it was just, it was suddenly it was super quiet. And the only real crowds you were seeing were just people that were lining up outside the banks, trying to get all their money out, uh, presumably to, to leave to Kabul. And we were trying to contact different interpreters we knew in the city. Everybody had left. Everybody had gone to Kabul and, and nobody was sort of there anymore. And eventually we found an interpreter through somebody who came and uh, we got in a cab and we said, well, let's just drive toward these front lines and, and see what's going on. And, and as we're driving out of the city, you just see you just see people in these tiny rickshaws, just families all stuffed in, coming and fleeing to the city. And, and, and all the shops outside the city were just completely shuttered. Um, you know, cars left on the road, just everybody had completely abandoned. It was just this ghost town. And and then suddenly the, the cab driver just stopped and he just said, I'm scared. I don't want to go further. And I thought, oh, oh gosh, OK, well, it's OK, we'll turn around. And then this interpreter is on his phone and he's talking away. And then suddenly he he turns around and he's got this big smile on his face and he says to me, oh, they just broke. There was three front lines. And he said they just broke through the first front line and, and we're completely surrounded. And I thought, oh my goodness. But even then, it didn't really sink in that much. And I thought, well, there's nothing I can do. I, I, I can't, I, you know, the earliest flight that I am booked on is Monday night. Um, and I can't, I can't get out, you know, via the roads because the Taliban's control those roads. So, you know, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I don't really think that that had fully sunk in yet either. And so I went back and I was just doing some work and distracting myself. And then Jake and I decided we'd go to this kebab cafe that we generally always go to. Um, and we went, it was just, I remember stepping out and there was just nobody in the street. And I remember thinking, this is just so strange. It's sort of, and yet every person that I'm calling and literally that afternoon, as this is all happening, I'm on the phone to, you know, a couple of my intelligence friends and, and they're sort of saying, you know, I think it's going to be okay till at least Monday till your flight, you'll be okay. It's going to hold for a little bit. So even then um, people were, you know, the assessments were completely wrong. And then, yeah, sort of, we, we went to this cafe and it was just dead quiet. And this was normally a place that was very vibrant. And, um, you know, they usually had these soap operas playing and there was just nobody in there. And we just looked at each other and we just went, we need to leave like this something something is very wrong um so we started to hurry back to the hotel and I remember turning around as before I'm about to go into the hotel and just and just seeing these motorcycles come in and that was the Taliban and you know and they're sort of shooting in the air and there was all this celebration and we kind of went to the roof um and it had this sort of big glass enclosure and we're just sort of watching it and it was just it was just like that and suddenly just just Taliban's after Taliban's after Taliban's um, are taking over the city and and suddenly you know I think the first text I got was a friend of mine who who worked for NPR and he's like are you still in Mazar we're hearing it's just fallen and I thought they're hearing all this I was I at that point I was just I was too anxious to even look at my <laughs> look at the news and see what was going on but you know everybody is suddenly going oh my goodness um are you okay what are you still there what are you doing and yeah, I think it's just that sort of surreal thing of, oh my goodness, this wasn't in my plan. Now what do I do? Um, so that first night was was really uncomfortable. And then the Taliban's were trying to get in downstairs and and the guards at the at the hotel had, you know, they dumped their weapons and they changed, they usually wore camouflage and they changed into ordinary Afghan clothes and you know, kept all night were just basically, you know, telling these tel Taliban, convincing these Taliban's to go away. Um and so it was just a very unsettling time because we didn't, again, we only knew the Taliban as an insurgency. We didn't know how they were going to treat foreigners or a journalist or a woman. Like it was just this, this big sense of being of unknown. And I remember I sent Jake out the next day to buy me a burqa. And <laughs> oh, man, go. He, yeah, I was like, go, go, go. And he came back. And he's like, oh my God, there's just so many of them. <laughs> you know, they're just everywhere. Um, so, you know. And just, out in the was, open too. Just yeah, being like, hello. Open. Yeah, and I just was like, this is just crazy. And I, and of course, Kabul fell the next day. So when Kabul fell, I just thought, oh my goodness, there's no way that anyone's coming to, to help me out now. Like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of done. Um, so I, 
yeah so we just sort of started plotting and, and calling a bunch of different people and really from the beginning and and I said this you know to the person I was speaking with in in the State Department in in Kabul I just said I'm going to go and talk to the Taliban and sure Holly yeah and, but to be honest they were like well you know that that's not not a possibility and I thought once they could have said that like kind of half-heartedly of well you know you know maybe we can bring that up with um you know in the Doha office or whatever and I said well I'm I'm gonna go and do it so several days went by <laughs> we're watching you know this immediate transformation of, of Mazar and I was feeling very guilty about the the, the guys in the hotel that had stayed to to really protect us and and they were scared and they wanted to go home to their families and you know there was no food left in the hotel and just you know all these things so um I just knew that okay we could we couldn't stay there for much longer we needed to get out and so we sort of used an intermediary to contact Taliban and then all of a sudden I didn't really know I didn't really hear back I didn't know what was going on um, and then, you know, all of a sudden this, some, you know, somebody called me and said, you know, get, get your bag together in 10 minutes and, and come downstairs. So I was like putting all my stuff together and went down into the sort of basement parking lot. And there were these two Taliban elders and, and they and I got into their car because <laughs> that's what you do. Um, and they just would, they sort of turned around and said, well, welcome to Afghanistan. And one of them was the, the cousin of the governor. I guess, you know, he was the shadow governor of Bolt province for a long time, but he was now the governor. And he says, oh, you know, my cousin, the governor wishes he could be here to greet you. But, you know, he's a bit busy with the, you know, the, the change. What? <laughs> yeah, it was very bizarre. So immediately my journalism, you know, kicks in. And I said, well, can I interview you? And we're driving through Mazar, <laughs> just... like hanging out with the Taliban elders. And then, so then I start interviewing them about Islamic war and they're telling me about the hand chopping and stoning for infidelity and, and hanging people for murder. And they're, they're very cheery and very nice and very softly spoken saying all this stuff. And it was just, it was crazy. And then, and then, um, and then we sort of got handed over. Um, they took us to the Uzbek consulate. And then we ended up getting handed over to these young Talibans who escorted us then to the Uzbek border because that was going to be easier than going to Kabul because it was sort of crazy. And so we got to Uzbek border. And then um, kind of ourselves that Jake and I are, we immediately turned around and said, oh, we're, we're coming back to Afghanistan. <laughs> um, so it was just... In a time that I guess everybody's trying to leave, you know, we're like, okay, no, we're going back. And yeah. I think that was really just, I felt an obligation to tell that story. I felt that, I felt that just because the U.S. was leaving didn't mean that the story needed to be abandoned. In fact, it was more important than ever to, to cover that transition. I thought it was such an incredible parcel of history, really. Um, and I felt that it needed to be told. And, and yeah, so I, I made that decision to drive all the way back, you know, from, from that 12 hour horrible journey. And it was really the first time you can drive across the country. So from that, that Uzbek border down to Kabul and, and, um, and, you know, see Afghanistan in this incredible light. And, and I felt confident in that decision as crazy as it, I think it seemed to, to the outside world where it was like, well, you know, how are you going to get out? What are you going to do? And, and I, I didn't really worry about those things because I knew that I planned to stay a while and I knew the situation would change. And I, I felt confident enough that, that, that just journalists needed to be there. And I was in a unique position where, you know, being a freelancer, nobody could really tell me what to do. And I know a lot of my colleagues that, that were working for publications had to leave. They weren't given a choice. Um, whereas for me, I felt that I, I had that choice and, and it was a, an important story to continue to tell. And so I, I, um, yeah, I ended up staying many more months. Yeah, you sure did. I know because when we were pulling people, we were, I was watching your reports each and every day on Instagram, just kind of watching where you were. And I, I remember you're just driving and that's the thing that I think that got me the most is like, you're, you're just in these vehicles, you're driving. And I know the Taliban checkpoints were there and I'm, I'm like, how is she just driving right through? Like there's being people just being stopped at these and everyone's having everything taken a shot in the head. And then you're just, you're rolling through the whole country with the smile on your face. And I think that's, what's different about your reporting is you don't just report the horrific. You also find a lot of the beauty in these survivors and, and people that are thriving after the, the war that ravaged their country. And 
the they're really looking at the positive and it's a uh, really humbling and really fills you with gratitude to see individuals that still find such light and love in their country and in their culture. And, you know, the idea that this, this isn't going to be forever, this will get better at some point. And those that are responsible really will be held responsible. And I, and I just, I think that's incredible. Um, I know I only had an hour with you, so I, I have many more things to ask you, but I will, uh, I'll honor that to the best of my ability. If you want to go a little over, that's fine. I just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just fascinated by your take on Afghanistan. And I was just kind of, kind of ask you a little bit about what's going on now, what you see for the future of Afghanistan and really the, the stance that it's going to have, because, you know, frankly, the, the Western media is not really reporting on much in, in that side of the world. And it's really troubling in my opinion, that we've just now stopped acknowledging this. And um, so I'd love to hear your your yeah. input. So I think, first of all, a point that I, I want to make is I think, you know, if I was here just reading through Twitter and a lot of what the mainstream media wants, I, I would just think, oh my gosh, there's genocide in the streets in Afghanistan. How is it possible to work there? And the point I think is really important is that the picture that was being painted just it really wasn't accurate um I think that certainly the Taliban need to be held to account for any any sort of abuse and retaliation that that happens but those cases were very much the exception not the rule for the most part the Taliban were putting on a very staunch sort of quest to to um to show themselves in a different line and they want that international recognition and so I think I think it was, you know, it was a little bit perplexing to me, honestly, to sort of see um, how it was sort of being portrayed a little bit in the media. And and I understand that that I think fear is very contagious. And I felt, I think that a lot of people were just very scared and they remembered the Taliban from the 1990s and they sort of perpetuated the sense of, of they're going to come after me. And, and, you know, when I'd sit and talk to people and I'd say, well, tell me about the threat. And and the threat would be just a letter that was fake that was being passed around on WhatsApp. Um, and so, you know, I'd sit in and try to sort of explain to them that that there's this sort of insatiable desire to leave. And I think in many cases, um, the, the threat isn't there. And, and I, it's not to take away from, from what's happening and what is happening, but for the most part, I think it's really the economy that that is driving people to, to need to leave. And it's certainly an awful economic and humanitarian uh, crisis that is happening in Afghanistan. But I think that it's um, it's also important to acknowledge that, that you know, to, to be able to go into a country and something I like to do as a journalist and go in with a very, with no agenda and with a very open mind as to what is happening and and I think for some reason there was this desire in the media, maybe because it clicks better or, or to sort of drive this narrative of, of a genocide and all these things happening. And, and quite frankly, it just wasn't accurate. Um, and so I, I think that it's also important just to acknowledge the facts as they are on the ground. And, and what we're seeing didn't, didn't match up to a lot of the reports and things that were, were kind of being perpetuated and, and often by, by reports or by diaspora or by people that just weren't in the country um so they obviously had a very different uh, different take on it but but not to say that that certain incidences didn't happen because you know certainly did and they definitely should be held to to account but i think you know as a journalist um yeah i, I mean i never had any any real issues at, at checkpoints in fact being a woman was a real advantage um usually they just see a woman and, and sort of wave you straight through um so which was kind of a little bit terrifying from a security point of view. Uh-huh. It was the same when you would go to, I'd go to any of the ministries. Certainly the Taliban's were not going to, to um, you know, to give me any kind of body checks. So, you know, anyone could pretty much walk through. Um, so being a woman and, you know, we used to joke that I was the passport because, you know, that's that's the way that, that the Taliban sees women. And, and I was a little bit, you know, at first, I think I was trying to be very respectful in, you know, because they don't, you know, look at women, acknowledge women. And I was sort of trying to be very respectful and staying back. But after a while, I just, 
I was like, you know, F this, this is, I, I'm not going to be in the background. I'm the person doing the interview here. So I made a very much a conscious effort to basically be in their face. Um, and I would just go and I would stare them down. In an interview, I would just stare at them and stare at them and stare at them until they finally broke and looked at me. And I'm telling you, 95% of the time they did, they broke and by the end of the interview, they acknowledged me. And I did see a big change in, in the Taliban's by the end where most of the Taliban's were actually greeting me when I walked into a room, which was a complete change from the beginning when yep. they just, they just <laughs> didn't, didn't exist. Um, but I, I felt that it was something small that I could do to make them aware of the fact that they're going to have to get used to women. And I also, you know, I take into account that they are, you know, many of them have never really seen a woman before. They've lived in very remote areas. They've only ever seen their mother and maybe sister and daughter if they have one. They've never seen a woman just in the street. So that to them, I think, was an incredibly new concept as well. And so I I just felt that it was important for me um, to to not sort of be subservient in the background, but rather to assert myself um, and to, to do whatever I could to get them to at least acknowledge that I existed. Um, so yeah, that but, was kind of my increasingly bratty approach that I took. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I, I'd argue that would be better. You're, you're, you're doing the women of Afghanistan a service by doing that because you're showing them that women, this is a behavior that is acceptable. This is how we are, it's okay for women to be upfront and to be deserved, to be greeted and to be acknowledged when they're in the room. It's, it's women should be utilized in this space, especially in Afghanistan. There's so many, you know, there's so many bright girls that are, you know, the opportunity for that culture to grow, that country to grow, to give it economic stability is often always through women. Women are the great uplifter. If you educate women, it seems like the, those cultures also do amazing when that happens. What do you see for the next little bit of Afghanistan? Because it seems... Yeah, it's a really challenging situation. I mean, the humanitarian crisis and, and economic crisis that... So when the, the US, when the Taliban came to power, the US froze uh, 9.5 billion in funding and you know, NGOs all left. And so what you're left with is, a, is an awful situation of just this incredibly fast declining Afghani currency, inflation, unemployment no medicine, it's impossible to get cash in the country. I couldn't, I couldn't get money out. I couldn't go to a Western Union. Like it just, it was very challenging. Um, I think that, you know, and, and being winter is, is just, it's an incredibly trying time for Afghan, Afghan people. And I, it sucks because, you know, they've suffered so much. And yet I would argue that they're, they're almost suffering more now, even though the brunt of the conflict itself has stopped, but, their lives are just they're so they're so difficult, and I, I really feel for the Afghan people because um, it's just they're going to continue to suffer. And I think the U.S. and the Western world is going to have to make this very uncomfortable decision of whether you deal deal with the Taliban and and you put conditions on them to be able to get the aid, um, and you support the Afghan people in that way, or you sort of want to turn a blind eye again and say, well, we're not going to deal with them because of their track record. Um, but it's not the Taliban who are going to suffer from that. It's, it's really the Afghan people. And I, I think they've been through enough at this point. And it seems like that when you write in your book, you speak about visiting the, the camps that yeah. the refugees have to go to. And you speak about it they're there for, it seems like that's their new home. That's just, there's yeah. no hope. There is, there is, um, yeah, especially in, in a place like Iraq where there was just, there was so much damage. And, and I'm grateful that Afghanistan doesn't have that sort of damage. In, in Iraq and in Syria, you just have entire cities that have been wiped out. I mean, the old city of Mosul, Raqqa, like just this unfathomable, it, it, it just, you know, like it, just, everything is being burned to the ground, um, usually with the aerial bombardments um, by the US and, and by the, the partner forces, you know, in order to, to get the Taliban out of those cities. And that is the challenge with the urban warfare. But I'm very grateful for the fact that, that Afghanistan doesn't have that sort of extensive damage um, in that way. So at least people do have homes that they can go to. Whereas in Iraq and Syria, 
you know, oftentimes your home, your home just does not lo any longer exist and you don't have the money to build another one. So there isn't a huge alternative other than to, to stay in these camps for really prolonged periods of time. And um, I can only imagine you know, that that is such a, it's such a difficult thing and, and, and the loss of dignity that comes from that when, you know, in these cultures, Dignity is, is just so important. It's really, you know, and to be able to lose that ability to provide for your family or to host a guest or in you know, all these things, that's something that, that really hits very hard for, for the Arapi and Syrian people. So how do people help the Afghanis that are the ones that are really going to suffer from this? Because it's like, it's like, it's, it's like a it's like when you're dealing with an abuser, that's not the abuser mm. that's going to suffer. It's, it's everybody else around them that's now left holding the bag. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and something I really drive is and there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, unfortunately, what I've seen is, is a lot of these GoFundMe campaigns um, that happened during evacuation times where a lot of people very well intentioned were raising a lot of money um, you know, for these evacuations, but, but without doing any due diligence to the fact that they actually logistically could not do the evacuations. Um, and the amount of people that would come to me and say, yeah, holy, what do I do? I've got, I've got a jet, I've got this, when you know, and the State Department is saying, well, no, you, you can't do that. Um, and so that's something that bothered me a lot because I thought here are a lot of well-meaning Americans that are trying to support Afghans and are donating to these campaigns. Um, but these campaigns are not doing anything. I'm talking, people have raised millions and millions of dollars. And yet, mm -hmm. and I question, you know, where did this money go? Because you didn't get anybody out. And it's not because you didn't want to, it's because you, you, you didn't do any research to figure out that you couldn't. You were so quick to raise money without actually understanding, you know, and I, and it, it bothered me a lot because I thought that money should have really gone to, to Afghan people that were stuck in Afghanistan. And I hope somehow it still does. Um, so I think, you know, instead of trying to kind of raise money to these very arbitrary and, and groups, I, I would really love to see people supporting those that, that are in Afghanistan that can't leave. And there are, there are several places I'm, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with an incredible hospital called Emergency, and they have, they have a war wounded hospital in Kabul, but they also have a lot of clinics around the country. And they just do incredible work. And, and it was founded by Gino Strada, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he was an Italian surgeon, really incredible person. And, and he founded it during the last reign of the Taliban. So they're very much used to dealing, you know, with the Taliban. And, and right. so for them, you know, it's just, it's a change of government. That's what it is. It's not the sort of this big, um, you know, uh, catastrophic event that, that we tend to portray it as. So these hospitals are just are so critical because it, it's at a time when the public hospital systems in Afghanistan are just heartbreaking. They're absolutely atrocious. And so we really need some of these private company, private NGOs to, to be able to stay afloat. Um, so ones like Emergency really do great things. Um, I've worked a lot with uh, another, another great um, German hospital, Irina Salimi, it's a pediatric hospital in Kabul that also does incredibly life-saving work. Um, ICRC, um, there's an incredibly wonderful human being by the name of uh, Alberto Cairo, and he's an Italian surgeon who runs the, the prosthetics program in Afghanistan. He's been there since 1990. It was his first ICR mission, and he he just, he, he wouldn't leave afterwards. He just, you know, wanted to stay, and he's this sort of incredibly funny, uh, very candid, you know, man who just, you know, has given Afghan people this incredible lease on life and, and being able to just give them that chance to walk again. And the ICRC is all over the country and really does incredible work. So they're just sort of three of the ones that I support a lot um, because we can't forget the Afghans that are there. And as important as it is, you know, to, to help Afghans wanting to leave, it's, it's equally, if not more important to help the ones that are, are left behind. And, and, um, and when it comes to things like medical care, I mean, it's just something that's so vital. None of us have a life without without being able to go to a, a decent hospital. Well, it's invaluable when you think about just yeah. getting an ear infection, not being able to go get an antibiotic for your child yeah. to stop screaming in pain. I can't imagine now being a parent, having to live in that type of situation. 
So what's next for you? You've got the book. You're here. You're back in the Western side for how long? Yeah. What, what do we expect to see? Um, so I'm here for a little bit. I've got a bunch of writing that I need to do. So I'm a little bit of a writing bubble. I'm with friends in Idaho at the moment. Um, actually, I need to get a place to live. I've been living out of a backpack for about two years. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's... You need to adult that's... now. You know, I just say this incredible commitment phobe, I think, where the idea of even signing a lease absolutely terrifies me. Um, it's a problem. We definitely, I get it. I definitely need to work through that. Um, but yes, I do need to get some roots. Um, I'm doing different sort of contract work at the moment. And then um, I have a couple of trips that I want to do next year. I do want to go back to Afghanistan in the spring. Um, but yeah, I just... I just love what I do. So, uh, but I do think it's important to have that home base here, which I don't, I don't really have at the moment, but I think that's <laughs> important to have that so I can, you know, freely travel in and out to different places um, on trips. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever live in a place the way that I've, I've lived in Afghanistan again, but, um, but certainly, you know, continuing to do, to do work and, and to go to these places for um, maybe, you know, slightly shorter periods of time, but, but definitely long enough to really um, be with the, the people and, and get the story. Well, you, you seem really at home there as it, yeah. crazy as that sounds. Yeah. It is. It, it, I feel like I felt like this with Iraq too, when I was going back and forth there a lot, I felt, yeah, it, it is home and Afghanistan, it is home. And, and, and it's weird, you know, when I'm talking to people, when I'm back here and it's already live and I, my instinct is I live in Kabul and I think well hang on a minute I don't know exactly when I'm going back there and I, I do need an American home but yeah it, it is it's home it's incredibly beautiful hospitable people and as I said earlier I'm just I'm so grateful that I know what it is that that I'm meant to be doing in my life and as much as that means sacrificing so many other things um in my life here, I just, it's worth it to me. Well, you know, you're doing a service to the rest of the world when you're telling the true, honest story. And it seems like the truth comes at a high cost nowadays. And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it's nice. It's nice to see people willing to uh, put their neck out for it. So we're grateful. The listeners are grateful. And I know everyone that will read your book, Only Cry for the Living, will be grateful. They might be a little, like you said, we've been sanitized and you know, it's the reality and it's, it's maybe what we need. Maybe we need to be shook a little bit. Maybe we need our, our younger generation to just be shook just for a second and realize that there's bigger issues than your phone dying. There's mm. real problems. There's real suffering in the world. And if we just took a second to look outside of ourselves, we could potentially just make the world a better place with a little effort. It doesn't yeah. seem that difficult. And so, yeah. um, Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, we're going to keep following and uh, I'll, I'll harass you to come back on and give us updates when you're, when you're to and from back Afghanistan again, and let us all know, cause it's important. Like you said, your work is important and getting the, the truth out there is important. And um, we're glad and, and glad that you could come on. Thank you so much for having me. I really, the support's really invaluable. So I think sometimes when you're working in these places, you feel like maybe everything you write is going into a black hole. So it's nice to know it's not. Well, yeah, there's no black holes here. I can promise <laughs> you that. And we appreciate it. So stick with me for a second, Holly. Everyone, I guess we'll see you all next week.